the Royal Navy is entering a new phase of its maritime evolution. After decades of focusing on carriers and destroyers, London has quietly begun designing a warship that blends assault, logistics, and high-tech modular warfare into a single platform, the Multi-Role Strike Ship, or MRSS. The lead design, unveiled as Elida Strike by BMT at DSEI 2025, could become the backbone of Britain's future amphibious force and perhaps the bridge to Australia's next generation of maritime capability. For years, the Royal Navy relied on the Albion-class landing ships and auxiliary vessels like RFA Argus to deliver the Royal Marines ashore. These ships were robust, but single purpose. In the era of distributed warfare, such specialization has become a liability. The MRSS is conceived to break that mold, a ship designed to adapt, to plug in new weapons or payloads, and to transform itself from a humanitarian platform into a literal strike hub within hours. According to BMT's presentation, Elida Strike will measure roughly 213 meters in length with a beam of 35 meters, making it large enough to host helicopters, landing craft, and a modular mission bay. It embodies the Royal Navy's new mantra, fitted for, but not with. This means the hull is prepared for future technologies. Vertical launch cells, laser systems, unmanned aircraft, even electromagnetic weapons, but not necessarily equipped with them on day one. The logic is industrial pragmatism. Build the hull now, upgrade the modules later. At its heart, MRSS is a multi-domain operations platform. It must serve as a command ship for special forces, a mothership for UAVs and USVs, a carrier of troops and vehicles, and a launch point for precision strike. The strike in Elida Strike is not marketing. It reflects Britain's intent to project force from the sea in contested littoral zones, where the enemy's anti-access systems make traditional amphibious assaults nearly impossible. BMT's design borrows from commercial container ship efficiency, but merges it with naval survivability, automated handling, a wide mission deck for rapid reconfiguration, and the ability to carry modular payload containers that can be swapped depending on the operation. Imagine a deployment to the Baltic or South China Sea where the ship begins as a logistics hub, but mid-deployment installs a directed energy module or drone control suite. The flexibility alone justifies its existence. Technologically, the MRSS is envisioned as a platform of platforms. Its core combat system would link sensors, AI-assisted command and control, and various effectors, laser, missile, drone, or electronic warfare nodes, through a shared digital backbone. This approach mirrors the ambitions of AUKUS Pillar 2, which promotes integration of advanced technologies like quantum sensing, cyber, and autonomous systems among the UK, Australia, and the United States. The British government has not yet confirmed the number of ships to be built, but the plan points to at least three MRSS units to replace existing amphibious assets in the early 2030s. Funding remains a challenge. The Royal Navy is already stretched by carrier sustainment, Type 26 frigate construction, and the dreadnought nuclear submarine program. Yet defense analysts note that the MRSS, at roughly 500 million pounds per hull, would be far cheaper than another major surface combatant and could deliver disproportionate strategic value. The Elida strike concept stands out because it goes beyond simple hull replacement. It's effectively a test bed for modular naval warfare. 
The Royal Navy could trial containerized missile systems, electronic warfare pods, or laser modules like Dragonfire directly on its mission deck. The same logic could later apply to high-power microwave systems or drone swarms. Here is where the Australian angle emerges. Canberra faces a similar dilemma. Aging amphibious ships, long supply lines, and rising pressure to build vessels that can operate flexibly across the Indo-Pacific. Australia's C-2200 program, which aims to improve sea lift and littoral capabilities, is seeking designs that resemble the MRSS concept. Australian defence media, such as Defence Connect, have already suggested that Elida Strike could serve as a model or partner platform for Australia's next wave of maritime projects. From an industrial perspective, the logic is compelling. Britain could provide design expertise and digital architecture, while Australia contributes manufacturing of mission modules, UAV systems, directed energy weapon mounts, or electronics bays. Such co-production would strengthen both nations' shipbuilding ecosystems and reduce dependence on U.S. suppliers. For AUKUS, that's critical. Sovereignty, interoperability, and speed. Operationally, an Anglo-Australian MRSS partnership could yield a common fleet standard. Both navies could train, sustain, and deploy together under one modular philosophy. For instance, a British MRSS operating in the Persian Gulf could swap mission containers with an Australian vessel in the Indo-Pacific, ensuring identical systems and logistics. This concept echoes the plug-and-fight idea behind NATO's next-generation land vehicles, but extended to the sea domain. Strategically, MRSS aligns perfectly with Britain's Global Britain posture and Australia's Regional Deterrence Doctrine. For London, MRSS represents affordable global reach a vessel that can sustain the Royal Marines far from home without carrier dependence. For Canberra, it's a potential model for distributed operations across vast archipelagos, enabling drone-based surveillance, sea denial missions, or humanitarian relief without large carrier groups. However, there are serious risks. Financially, the UK's procurement system is under immense strain. A downturn in budgets could delay or shrink the MRSS fleet. Technologically, the challenge of integrating advanced power systems for lasers and VLS modules remains unsolved. Operationally, the MRSS will not survive high-end peer combat alone. It will require escorts and layered protection. Politically, the program competes for attention with sexier assets like submarines and stealth fighters, making it vulnerable to bureaucratic neglect. Another obstacle is industrial sequencing. British shipyards are already saturated with Type 26 frigates and support vessels. If MRSS construction slips into the late 2030s, the Royal Marines risk losing a decade of amphibious readiness. Analysts have warned that without early funding, the program could devolve into paper concepts, much like earlier future littoral strike ship proposals that never materialized. Despite these hurdles, MRSS offers something unique, a vision that fits both strategic reality and industrial necessity. It isn't just about building ships, it's about designing adaptability into the fleet. In an era when threats evolve faster than procurement cycles, flexibility is power. Looking forward, three scenarios emerge. In the best case, MRSS receives stable funding, enters production by 2028, and delivers three ships before 2033. These vessels become joint test beds for AUKUS technologies, directed energy weapons, autonomous boats, 
and modular strike payloads shared between British and Australian industry. In the middling outcome, one or two ships are built, but with limited weapon integration, serving mainly as logistic or training assets. The concept survives, but without transformative impact. In the worst case, budget cuts push MRSS behind other priorities, forcing the Royal Marines to operate aging amphibs and limiting Britain's expeditionary credibility. To avoid that fate, three actions are essential. First, prioritize modular design now. Even if some systems are unfitted, the architecture must allow rapid retrofitting of AUKUS technologies. Second, build industrial partnerships with Australia early, letting both nations share risk and accelerate innovation. Third, test and demonstrate MRSS capabilities through small-scale prototypes, containerized VLS, UAV bays, or DEW trials to prove value before full construction. The MRSS story is more than a procurement plan, it is a statement of intent. It shows that Britain still aims to project maritime power globally, not through sheer tonnage, but through smart design and cooperation. For Australia, it signals that the future fleet may be built not in isolation, but alongside its closest technological ally. If realized, the Elida strike could become the most important warship class since the Type 26 frigate, not because of what it carries today, but because of what it could carry tomorrow. It represents a shift from ships as weapons to ships as adaptable platforms, a philosophy that aligns perfectly with the networked warfare of the 2030s. The future of the Anglo-Australian Navy may not rest solely under the waves with nuclear submarines, but on the surface, aboard flexible ships like MRSS, quietly rewriting the rules of maritime power. <laughs>